Number eight, faith in God is faith in his word. Number nine, faith accept God's promises and receive God's rewards and blessings. And number ten, action is the catalyst that releases the power of God. Number eleven, love, agape love is what makes faith effective. Can I have faith in the love? It doesn't work like that. Check yourself. Do a little self-evaluation find out what's going on. Something, I guarantee that you're in error. You got to have faith in love. Faith with love. They go, to, they, go to, they go together. That's why I say the twins. We call them the twin towers. Your faith grows as you practice walking in love. Number 12. Number 13. One of the highest forms of love is in forgiving someone. This is what God says. This is what God commanded. And we do the Lord's Prayer. That's what he tells us. 14. The faith that pleases God says what it wants, what it believes, that it has it, and forgives others. Number 15. Faith working through love allows you to tap into the force that created the universe. And number 16. The power of twins. Faith and love makes God power effective in your life. And if you're not doing these, if you're not working it, this is a job itself. If you're not doing this, you're not going to be effective. You can do it out of self will. You can do it your way, but you're not going to have power. You're not going to have God's power, and you're not going to be effective. You're just going to be doing something. And I'm telling you, you're not going to be happy, saying, if you don't do what God commands us to do. And if we don't work it, if we don't see God's face, and if we don't read and study and meditate and apply the word, we're not going to see success. We're not going to be effective. We're going to get we're going to get focused. We're going to get frustrated. We're going to get unfocused. We're going to be unproductive, and we're going to want to quit God. You don't have a right to quit God. I don't have a right to quit God because we are too lazy to get up and read our Bible. We're too, we're, too eight, we're too lazy to get up, take the Bible off the coffee table on a nightstand and out of the drawer. Take it out of the drawer. Start putting that Bible up by you. I keep it by me and I, and I keep it mine open on Psalms 91 or Psalms 23. Keep it open. You know, keep it visible. Keep this book visible and read it. I don't care if you take five minutes. God will honor five minutes. He can take five, increase five minutes to 10, 10 to 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 6 an hour, an hour to an hour and a half, an hour and a half to two hours, to three hours, to four hours. I'll be up here sometimes in the Bible from um, 8 in the morning till after 12 sometimes. I'm just in the Word that I'm not even hungry. I'm just, I'm getting fed off the Word of God is feeding me. I'm getting full off the Word. That's what it would do. It's not going to happen overnight. It takes a habit form. It takes repetitiveness and repetition for you to keep doing it. You know, find a time. I have time. Unfortunately, I have time now where I make it possible in the morning. Or sometimes in, if, if, when school's out, like the summer, it's get noisy in here. I don't have the peace no more. So I'll find it maybe in the afternoon to do it. But I'm setting aside time to read the Bible and study the Word of God. I got to do it. God don't have a respectful person. If I have to do it, you're going to have to do it to see results, to be effective. You're going to have to do it. If you want to walk in victory, you're going to have to put the work in, baby. I'm telling you, just being saved, hey, okay, that's good. Now that we have Jesus, we have to grow our faith. We have to grow. We cannot be immature. We cannot stay babies. We cannot be babes. We got to grow. This is a, this is a lifetime um, life changing, a lifetime process. This is not an overnight sensation. This is not something that's going to happen like this. You know, God is not some kind of genie in a bottle. You know, um, this is not some kind of magic or anything. It takes time studying and studying and reading, reading over and reading those scriptures over and over again. And, and the best thing for me, I, I feel, is fellowship. Getting with somebody else. Get with some old saints in your church. Um, get get with get with your family. Get with your neighbors in your community. You know, get with your co-workers. Hey, I'm having a Bible study on this Saturday. If you're working and say, you know, just one hour, two hours, 
You know, I'm going to have this or I'm going to provide this. Take turns on each and everybody house and do a fellowship Bible study, word study with each and every one of them. With each one. You guys switch. But you got to get Bible study in um, at least six days a week. And then go to church on Sunday and fellowship and praise God. It is more powerful that way. I, I find it just beneficial for me when I'm in the word six days a week. And I go fellowship on church. I, I, I'm in agreeing with the pastor. And I'm feeling the choir, the band. It's just all in sync. And I'm just, I get emotional. I get emotional because I know what's happening. I can feel the presence of the Lord. You know, and, I, I, you know, you get, I get built up. You know, built up. And um, you can either, you got a choice. You stay home. And continue watching TV, stuff that's not going to edify you. Because reality shows, those ladies, they're successful, but look at their attitude. A lot of them not saved. We can sit here and listen to Beyonce and watch videos and Rihanna. But listen, those women, Nicki Minaj or whoever we met, mentoring ourselves after, uh, Little Wayne. But see, those people there, they're not saved. And those people have millions of dollars. And we can never, with a 9 to 5 job, or no job, period, or with just a, uh, uh, a fixed income, we can never get on their level. You're never going to be there. You're never going to have the money that they have. They get star treatment. They have the money to do that. You don't have $54 million. You don't have $100 million. You don't have $200 million. Beyonce, Beyonce is worth $300 or $400 million. She can afford her lifestyle. You know, we need to be comfortable in our own skin. We need to be comfortable who we are. We need to embrace who we are. We need to love who we are. And we need to be content with what God has us at. He will increase it. You know? But we got to put God first. Got to learn how to put God first before the foolishness. You know? Reality is this word. We're going to need this word before it's over. You're going to need this word. This word has been here in the beginning. And we all out of here. This word still going to be here. God's word still going to be here. We need this word. I'm telling you. You know, it's life changing. It's life changing. You know, it builds you up. It makes you want to do right, act right, walk right, speak right, love right, reach others. You know, you got to spend some time in this Bible. I don't care if it's a, a, a few minutes. It's okay because I had started out that way. I didn't just dove into this. You know, I have been reading this Bible since, I think, dedicate myself to, to, since 2007. I have. I'm not ashamed to tell you, since 2007. It's 2013. When I really poured myself in this Bible was uh, in 2009. Around August, September 2009, I had the Bible study started with a group of some neighbors and some associates in 2010, the summer 2010. And you know what? I'm still in this Bible. You know, I've read it three times. Now I'm reading and studying it and meditating on it and learn to do what God commands me to do if I'm going to be successful and effective. And in, and in, in this um in, in this faith in my faith in my my Christian walk in my spirituality if I'm gonna be effective I'm gonna have to get in the word if I'm gonna go out and you know spread news and pour into others God requires me to get in this word you know if you require me you require you. No one is exempt. No one's out of God's reach. God wants us to spend, have an intimacy with Him. He wants us to spend time in His Word. And if we're working, it's okay because I worked for 34 years, 20 years in property management. I used to take my Bible with me, a little small pocket sized Bible, about this big. I used to get to work about maybe sometimes an hour or 30 minutes before. I like to get there early and I like to unwind. I like to prepare myself. I don't like to just go in at, at, at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. I don't like that. 
people all in my face. I got to be decent in order. I got to be prepared. I got to have my coffee. I got to have a little something. I got to do my prayer. I got to do my reading. And when I did that consistently, um, I saw my day went better. I saw how I, I was able, God was able to command my day. And it was peaceful. You know, I used to take it with me. We work, we can get up early. Get up 30 minutes early than you do. And take a few minutes out while everybody's asleep. Get your coffee. Relax. Get your bath or whatever you need to do. Or before, whatever, go in your secret closet. Go in your secret place in your home. And read. Just read a few scriptures. Say a prayer and read. Even if it's the Lord's Prayer. God said he knows what we need, so we don't have to keep asking him. There's nothing wrong with keep being repetition, asking God, because he likes being persistent. As long as his heart fell, you know, as long as we believe, you know, and as long as it's a uh, right motive and desire in our heart, you know. But, you know, and, and getting your Bible, you know, you begin to change. Your family will begin to change. You will begin to change, too, you know. And uh, God will be able to restore you and restore your family. I'm telling you this not because no, I'm not getting paid to do this. I'm telling you this because it's the truth. It worked for me. I had to start somewhere. Everybody, every preacher out there, every teacher out there, where it's Crefro, where it's Joyce Meyer, where it's T. Jakes, where it's Juanita Byam, where it's Marvin Sapp, or where it's whoever it is, they had to start somewhere. They had to start somewhere from the bottom, you know. Christ Fellowship, where I, I attend, uh, Pastor Mullins, they had to start uh, five people in their living room. And they grew and grew and grew. You know, it started just like a home base, you know. And look, they're huge. They're huge. And they're expanding all over. They're buying, um, they just bought 321 acres up in Stewart. They're growing, you know. And... Uh, they bought um, a, a space in the Boynton Mall. I mean, they're City Place. They are at Wellington. They, you know, it, you know, it's just they just growing. You know, because they're faithful. They believe, and they're faithful. They stay faith. They stay faithful. God gave them assignment. They did not abort God's assignment, even though it was small. They were faithful. I say, if you're faithful for the little things, He will give you many. He will increase it. You know, you honor it, you know, and it takes time, but you'll get there. You'll get there, you know. I'm praying for you to get there. Pray for me. I get there, too, and stay there. Now, I'm going to talk about the force that created the universe a little bit, and I'm going to probably start right here. And continue this study uh, another time. I'm going to just skim through here a little bit. God has designed a foundation for you to build your life upon. Building on this foundation will allow you to realize your God-given dream. This foundation will help you reach your full potential and ensure lasting success. The following scriptures lays the following scriptures lies that lays the foundation that would enable you to tap into the force that created the universe. So look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A new creation has the ability to tap into the force that created the universe. The answers to the following four questions will help you understand the, the significance of being a new creation. I'm going to ask you four questions. Number one, what does it mean to be in Christ? And number two, what does it mean to be a new creation? You just told us. And number three, what are the old things that have passed away? And number four, what things have become new? And we're going to find the answers to these questions. Let's start with number one. What does it mean to be in Christ? The phrase in Christ refers to a relationship between God and an individual. It is not because you belong to a particular church or attend a particular religious meeting that you have the benefits of God. It is because you belong to 
Jesus. To be in Christ is to be a child of God, a son or a daughter of the creator of the universe. Galatians 3.26, New Living Translation say, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You are in the family of God through faith in Christ Jesus. God is your spiritual father, and it was he who created the universe. God created everything, and you, as a child of God, have become an heir to it all. Somebody asked you, what does it mean to be Christ? I just told you. God created mankind to have fellowship with him, to have dominion over all the earth, and to enjoy life in union and communion with him. People ask you, um, why did God create a man? That was the answer. Fellowship includes intimate conversation and communion. One of the greatest desires of an earthly parent is to have fellowship, intimate conversation, and communion with his or her children. And so it is with your Heavenly Father. You can talk to God just as you will talk to a loving parent. Galatians 4, 6 says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. The phrase Abba means Father. It refers to a close, intimate relationship with God. Abba, Father is expressive of an especially close relationship between a child and a loving father. God is the Father. God the Father is a God of love. And you are an heir of God through Christ. We're joint heirs through Jesus. Galatians 4, 7, Amplifier says, Therefore you are no longer a slave, which is a bond servant, but you are a son. And if a son, then, meaning it follows that you are an heir by the aid of God through Christ, Jesus Christ. You have been given an inheritance, an inheritance to enjoy. And as son or daughter of God, your inheritance is revealed in you in Christ. We can also go see Ephesians 1 verse 11. You have become an heir to everything God says you are. Everything God says you have, and you are heir to everything God says you can do. You're joint heir to Jesus. And as a child of God, you have the access to all God's resources. And as God's heir, you can claim what he has provided for you. You are, you are God's child. You have been adopted into his royal family, according to Ephesians 1, 5, New Living Translation, King James Version, the app, uh, the NIV, whatever you want to go by. You, um, your inheritance includes all the blessings of God. You have the ability to receive the provision God has already provided for you. You can live an enjoyable and satisfying life. That's what God wants us to do, abundant life. We, you know... We should be sad and broken and lack and going through and just enough. God wants us to enjoy a satisfying life. God's will for your life is that you embrace the rights. You embrace the privileges and responsibilities of a child in God's family. Let's look at Ephesians 2.10, Amplify your verse says, For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, mean planned beforehand, for us taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we shall walk in them, living a good life, which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. The Greek word translated workmanship is the word uh, paima, paima, from which we get the English word poem. A poem. It literally means a work of art. God created you, his work of art, with the prudential to accomplish the work he gave you to do. Your work, the path you are to take, is the realization of your God-given dream. God made provision 
for you to be able to realize your God-given dream. And that provision was made before you were placed on the earth. You receive the blessings of God into your life as you fulfill the plan he has for you on this earth. You are loved and cherished one of a kind creation. You are special, you're unique, and you're, you're irreplaceable. We are kings and queens. God hold us highly valuable. And why not hold yourself highly valuable? That's how God see us. God see the best in us. He doesn't see how man's natural eyes see us. God see the best. God has specific plans for you that nobody else can accomplish. Only you can complete the work that has been assigned to you. And only you can realize your God-given dream. You were created not just to exist, but to live a fulfilled and a significant life. God prearranged and made it available everything that is necessary for you to live the good life. The good works God planned ahead of time for you to accomplish include the realization of your God-given dream. Isn't that awesome? Now, when I come back, we're going to talk about what does it mean to be a new creation. We're going to talk about what does it mean. This is a good, awesome teaching. And um, I just had to teach on this. And, and this is somebody out there need this teaching. I know I need it. 